Good afternoon and welcome. The program is called the Veterans Forum. It's a program put on here at the Bedford Community Television Studio in cooperation with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Now that's been in force, if you will, since the year 2000, wherein they have asked stations such as this throughout the country if they can and will donate their time and talents so that any veteran, male or female, who served in any of the wars, World War II, Korea, the Vietnam, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Venezuela, or what have you, if they can and will share their experiences with us in this televised interview. That will then be fed to the library and they put it in their database so that anybody from here on out who wants to find out about you or maybe your family uh, can do that, just that. Before I start today's program, though, I would like to share this with you. I got this a couple of weeks ago. It's a notice of a special program, a telephone link, that's been set up throughout the state in New Hampshire, where any guy or gal who may be needing help, or if their friends think they may need some help, by dialing this number, 211, will put you in type, in contact with this. You can't read it, but it's a card to people and services throughout the state who will be there to help you. The only requirement or qualification is you must have had at least six months honorable service and an honorable discharge. Ask for it and it'll be there. It will be there, but you have to ask for it. Today is a, another, if you will, the date-wise, today is the 4th of February, 2016. Now, we've been doing this show since 2007, so there's a lot of guys and gals who have come forward. I'll ask Warren to introduce himself, and then we'll take the show from there, if you will, sir. Tell us your name, where you now live, and your rank in service, time of discharge, you can. My name is Warren Koch. I was born in... No, no, where were you born? Just where do you live now? Oh, I live now in Manchester, New Hampshire. Army branch, A I, Air Force? I was in the Air Force. From, from when to when? From... Uh, March of, March of 1943 until March of 1946. Okay, very good, thank uh, you. Now, what I'd like to do, now that we know who you are right now, and we have a picture that I'd like to talk about, if you will, of, of you way back when, when you were commissioned a shiny lieutenant. Okay? Yep. Now, to go from that to where we are, Let's go back and find out how you became. Where and when were you born? I was born in New York City in October of 1923. And uh, you're an only child. You have brothers, oh, okay. sisters, the whole yeah. family. The whole boy. family. Okay. I have I have two two uh, sisters, neither of whom is with us any longer. Oh. Uh, my family. We grew up on Long Island from the time I was an infant. I went to grammar school there, I went to high school there, and then I went away to uh, college at St. Lawrence University in um, uh, Canton, New York. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> now, you, I'm being unkind, but you took one big bite of time, if you will. I'd like to find out what you did as you're growing up in first, second, third grade, kindergarten, high school, whatever, as how you developed any particular habits or sports, any special dream like that. I enjoyed sports, but I never played on a high school team. I, I played a little bit on a high school tennis team, but that's all. I did play a lot of uh, intramural sports. Okay. And uh, when I was a kid, why neighborhoods had uh, baseball teams for the kids, and, and I participated in that. And I, I uh, played uh, fraternity hockey in college, oh. which is pretty far down from the college team, but good it was, had a good it was time doing it. Had a good it, time yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, how was life growing up? You said in, in '23, so you came through the, the depression like a lot of us did. What was your life like then? Did you have any real problems or not? Well, actually, I was pretty lucky. Uh, my dad was never out of work, and uh, what kind of work did he do? Uh, he he was a sales manager for Brillo. If you know what Brillo oh, is. Oh yeah, the scratch yeah. pads. Yeah. And, and uh, he. Uh, he was very successful at it. Good. And, and so we fortunately uh, wasn't, things weren't all rosy, but things weren't bad either. Okay. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, I went away to school in, in uh, 
September of 41. When I went from where to where? From, I went from uh, Salonica High School in Long Island in Floral Park to uh, St. Lawrence University upstate in New York, mm -hmm. right up near the uh, St. Lawrence River. Yeah. And uh, I was in my sophomore year when uh, Congress lowered the draft age to 19. So my roommate and I, he was in the same predicament. We rushed over to a nearby town where there was an enlistment office, and the two of us signed up for the Army Reserve. I really wanted to sign up for the Air Corps Reserve, but uh, they couldn't do that at that point. They told me when I went home at Christmas time to go to the big recruiting office on 42nd Street in New York City and try to get myself transferred over into the uh, cadet flying program, which okay. is what I was interested in. I had, <clears throat> as a kid, I had always been very interested in model airplanes. And that plus the fact I decided I really didn't want to be in the Army and end up walking. I'd much rather fly. <laughs> yeah, get there quicker. So, so I did that. I went to uh, the recruiting station yeah. at Christmas and uh, passed all the exams that they were interested in and uh, was reassigned to the Air Corps Reserve. And they told me to go back to college, and they called me when they wanted me. So I went back to school, and when it got to be late in February, they sent me a letter and told me to show up. Yeah, come on down. Come on down and, and uh, be there on, I think it was March 18th, as I recall. I had to be in Penn Station in New York City. And they put me and uh, I don't know how many others, but it was quite a crowd on a train at Penn Station going to Atlantic City in New Jersey. And uh, that, in effect, was uh, basic training. And, and <laughs> What, getting on the train or something? Oh, oh getting to Atlantic City. Oh. Uh, they, they billeted us in the uh, Traymore Hotel, which I got a big kick out of because I had stayed there before on a vacation. And uh, it was quite different from the time I saw it before. What were the differences? I mean, were any they, different treatment, they, different well, they, accommodations? They, the accommodations were certainly different. <laughs> they took all the rugs out of all the rooms, took all the furniture out except for the bunks. And the desks? The, 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 uh, no desks uh, at all. And the f formerly very attractive dining rooms became mess halls with no frills, just uh, regular benches for, uh, for eating. Yeah, but you ate off plates rather than tin cans. Yeah, we trays. Ate, no, we ate on tin trays. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Good indoctrination. Yeah. And, and uh, we did a great deal of walking on, in, in formation, we did a great deal of walking on the boardwalk. And they walked us down to an area on the end, off the end of uh, the north end of the beach that, that uh, we did all our marching uh, routines at. And we also went there for a lot of physical training. Uh, I. I had the unfe unpleasant uh, 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 happening of catching German measles, and I ended up in a measles hospital. I was not alone. They had a lot of, a lot of uh, enlistees there. But, but I was there for about five weeks, and then uh, a group of us were sent to uh, Niagara University in Niagara, Unifor Uni uh, in Ni uh, Niagara Falls, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't any honeymoon, believe me. Uh oh. Uh, I guess there may have been 150 uh, cadets, which we now became, uh, at their, uh, there at that time. We uh, had extensive uh, physical training every day. We went to class almost all day. And then we marched around for an hour or two in the evening. Uh, Just to keep before, you limbered up. For huh? dinner, yeah, keep us limber. So we learned some more uh, math and some more physics and some uh, uh, basic information on map making. And oh, we had a couple of other subjects. I can't recall all of them right now. The instructors were, Niagara is a Catholic university. The instructors were uh, Catholic brothers, and they were all very good. And uh, were I, I they stern as some of the GI, DIs? Uh, well, the, the, uh, there was a captain there. Uh, an army captain, an a, uh, air corps captain, who was sort of a martinet, and he ran the uh, the military part of the right. operation. And uh, he had us doing West Point type parades several days a week, and uh, he, he was he was very good at it. 
kept telling us how much tougher things are going to get. Oh, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we went from there. I guess we must have been at Niagara for, oh, four months. Now, how is this related to the Air Corps? Or is this just, well, just basic information? No, it's related to the uh, Air Corps flying program. Uh, they apparently had many uh, reserves, reservists mm -hmm. sign up for the program, but they couldn't handle them all in, in the flying schools right away. And, and they didn't all have the same education. So as I understand it, it was a combination of bringing uh, increasing the education for some people and didn't do any harm for the other people who had already well, no. had it. Yeah. But it also <clears throat> gave them time to get people in physical shape and get them ready to, uh, for military service. Okay. Now this is all pre-flight. You haven't this gotten is, anything with the plane we yet. We haven't gotten a pre-flight yet. Okay. okay. So after we left Niagara, we all went to, uh, all, all in the group, went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and there they gave us psychological tests, dexterity tests, uh, quick thinking tests, and they used the information to decide whether they were going to train us to be pilots or navigators or bombardiers. And so, so, some of the tests they had were really kind of fun. I remember for one example. Uh, for example, they had one that was like the top of a uh, turntable for playing music. Yeah, uh, and, and it had a gold dot on it, and they'd, they'd, they'd have it, pardon me, rotating, and then they'd hand, us, hand the individual a, a poker that was hinged in the middle, a long poker that could mm -hmm. go up and down. And while they uh, asked, asked you to do other things verbally, they also wanted you to keep the, the tip of the poker on the, dot. on the dot as it went around. Uh -huh. And <laughs> it was quite a contest. But they were, they were very interested in, in hand-eye coordination, too. Okay. So uh, that took about two and a half, three weeks. Did you do well? Uh, I did, as far as I was concerned. I came out uh, for a pilot training. Okay. I think everybody who went there wanted to be a pilot. Oh, yeah. But uh, some of them did come out as bombardiers and navigators. And I went from there to uh, pre-flight pre school in uh, Maxwell, at Maxwell Field in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, that was real spit and polish. Uh, we uh, went to class every, classes every day. We did no flying. Uh, we did a great deal of uh, f uh, physical exercise to get us in shape. In fact, most of the uh, PT instructors apparently were big time college athletes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of uh, supermen. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, we, we took classes in things such as aircraft recognition, uh, Morse code. Did you get uh, to shoot anything at all? Uh, Small me? arms and rifle shooting? Or no, we did no shooting of any oh. kind. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, well, what other classes did we have? We had uh, Map maps reading? and charts. Yeah. Uh, there, there were several other technical type courses that okay. they were teaching. Uh, very well done. And uh, we all got to be pretty good uh, soldiers in their, in their retreat parades. And uh, while we were there, they marched several thousand of us down to uh, downtown and put us in a uh, uh, war, bond, war bond raising parade with our white gloves and our propeller hats on. Well, I, the insignia, of course, for a mm -hmm. cadet was a propeller on, yeah. the, on the head. You know, those old fashioned planes. Yeah, the old fashioned. Old fashioned. So uh, the weather in, in the, the southeast had been poor, and they were backed up a little bit. So instead of leaving Maxwell Field when we should, it was delayed, and they gave everybody a 10-day leave right around Christmas time. Couldn't have, been, <laughs> couldn't have been better. Good timing. Very good timing, yeah. So we did go from Maxwell Field to Lodwick Field, which is a private, privately owned field, privately operated field in uh, Lakeland, Florida, and there we started flying uh, Stearman biplanes. Okay, stop for just a second. Hmm. Uh, when you got your 10 days, Class A uniforms when you went home, how did you feel when you walked in? Pretty good. Okay. Uh, but, but then we, we uh, 
I guess crappy. we acted like soldiers and walked like okay. soldiers, yeah. and, and uh, it was great to get home again. Oh, yeah. I, by that time, I had been away for, what, eight or nine months. Uh, it was good timing. Good. Good timing. Right. Very good timing. Uh, but to get back to the flying, here we go. Uh, for someone who isn't familiar with a Stearman, it's very basic. There are no electronics. The instructor has to talk to you by talking into a tube. Mm -hmm. yeah, I should say, it has to shout to you. By oh, shouting what's the configuration? Through. You in front or he in front? He's in front and, and mm -hmm. I'm so, in the rear. Okay. And I think all, not all, but most all military pilots, Navy, Army, Marines, have, been, have started out with flying, flying a stairman. You, you do all kinds of uh, uh, maneuvers that were, I think they came from World War I. Mm-hmm. Uh, turns. Immelman, yeah. Immelman's and rolls and loops, uh, loops and, and uh, all kinds of yeah. calisthenics. How did you feel doing it the first time you had control? Uh, in the beginning, all, all cadets over control, mm -hmm. but, but that wears off fairly quickly. I enjoyed it. To me, it was fun. I looked forward to flying every day. Good. And we had ground school every day. I, I think I learned a great deal about uh, uh, electric engines and... and uh, what makes an airplane fly, and, and they did a good job, very good job. Uh, the uh, military part of uh, of life was was pretty pretty low key there. We we did have a couple of uh, officers who uh, kept us acting like soldiers, but we didn't spend an awful lot of time doing drill and so forth. Uh, I guess that's about it. Oh, we had we had a. Uh, very nice arrangement. The, uh, the ladies' group in town uh, had a uh, lounge they ran for the cadets. So on a oh, just the cadets just or for anybody? Just for air cadets. Oh. And, and if, if uh, we were free on a Friday evening, we could go there. They, they had a lounge. They ran a couple of dances. Uh, it was a it was nice, nice uh, addition to the program. The Army, had no, the Army had nothing to do with running the program, but it was well done. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> Pardon me. Then I went from there to uh, Cortland, Alabama, which is way up in redneck country in northern Alabama, up near the TVA dam. And uh, we flew a uh, more powerful single-engine airplane. Uh, I called it a BT-13, I think. It, it uh, was yes, mono-wing or bi-wing? One-wing, a single low-wing okay. airplane, okay? Probably also used by uh, the Navy, I would suspect. Uh, it it uh, it was it had it had flaps on it which we didn't have before on, on a Stearman. It had uh, a two-speed propeller which we didn't have on a Stearman. It had about twice as much power as the Stearman had. Uh, it was responsive though when you maneuvered. It was very responsive. Yeah, it was a nice airplane to fly. Yeah. I think it's an airplane that uh, is often used in the movies when they want to sh show. They used to use them in movies where they show Japanese airplanes and they mark them up. Oh, a little paint makes them more little paint. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> but uh, that was um, that was also a fun fun place. Okay. I, I enjoyed it. What's the washout rate? Mm -hmm. I can't give you a number, but there were people who disappeared okay. both at. at uh, primary school and yeah. in, in basic. Uh, okay. I guess that's about it. Then I went from there to uh, advanced, and, and uh, here they made a separation because uh, some pilots went to uh, single-engine tr advanced training and some went to multi-engine. I went to multi-engine. Multi Any reason why? Uh, well, I had, I, they, they had asked us a couple times before what we'd like to fly. Mm -hmm. and, I always said multi-engine. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. I think more than more than that, it probably was based on some of the stuff that you told them in all the psychological oh, yeah. tests. That paper the, trail all, they'll grab you every time. All the hot shots yeah. that wanted to be uh, uh, pursuit plane pilots. Uh, I shouldn't say that, but uh, and and uh, bigger people went to uh, multi-engine also. Just as a matter of, you mean bigger uh, physically? Phys bigger physically, yeah. Okay, a little more room in the cockpit. A little, little more better co accommodation, yeah. So I w went to uh, uh, multi-engine advanced training in Seymour, Indiana, 
Well, Seymour was the air base. It was, it was, Seymour was the town, the air base was Freeman. I'm sorry, I'm mixing them up. No. And uh, uh, that was a, new, a very new experience. The airplane had a completely changeable pitch propeller. Uh, I believe, if I remember right, we had to set the manifold pressure. We had a complete set of flaps. Uh, we had to learn to fly with one engine or as well as the two engines. Uh, what else did we do? How about gunning practice? Or did you have any practice bombing or anything like that? Or is it no, still no. getting used to the plane? Still getting used to the plane. We, we, did, it, we did a great many uh, takeoffs and landings. Well, we did that with the two previous places. Uh, we started night flying. We started formation flying. Uh, I was in uh, Indiana if in uh, the hottest time of the year. It was in uh, June and July. And it was lovely to fly at night when it was cool. Cool, yeah. <laughs> because there was no air conditioning on the ground, but it was cool if you got up several thousand feet and, and uh, or even a little bit more. So that part was great. Uh, Did you feel any more comfort or discomfort flying at night as opposed to daytime so that? It's a little bit deceptive uh, when you, at first, trying to, uh, when, you, when you see other airplanes or, or the lights, uh, it isn't always easy to uh, line everything up okay. like you want to, but it doesn't take long. There was something else. Oh, we did a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, uh, flying with uh, instruments uh, okay. a great deal. They'd put a green uh, celluloid over the cocktail win over the cockpit windows, and you'd put wear red glasses, so the exterior. When you look at the airplane, it's it's dark out, mm -hmm. and and uh, I guess we spent almost half of our time flying around like we were on instruments, and we made instrument takeoffs. Uh, obviously, we couldn't make take uh, instrument landings. We didn't have that kind of technology at no, the time. IFF at no, that no IFF at that But uh, we uh, handled emergencies by pulling one engine off. Uh, we went th through quite a few uh, different practice sessions where they pu pull different okay. uh, ideas. Now, did us. they keep the same gang together all the time, or did you keep changing different positions, different well, we only had we only had two uh, two pilot seats, obviously. Okay. And and uh, so you were either up there with another cadet or with an instructor. Uh, it's just a two passenger, two two seat airplane. Okay, really. left and right seats. And and the airplane was it was a beach beach craft, and it was essentially made of plywood. So <laughs> it had the unique capability of when you wanted to make a land make a landing, it was difficult to stall it out gracefully. It would, you'd be right down just off the runway at a fairly pretty low speed with the flaps down and, and all of a sudden it would just go It'd bang. Drop like drop a like, clunker. Like a, like a clunker, yeah. But if you're making a good landing, you're pretty close to the ground okay. anyhow. You, you kind of feel into it when you're coming down, don't you? Oh, yes, but we, we were using, uh, we weren't, Flying into the ground with the with the engines on, we we had pulled the engines off okay. when we got down that far, and we'd consider it a good landing if if you still had the earphones over your ears after you landed. Yeah, the wings are still out there. <laughs> yeah, well, they, luckily they stayed there pretty much. Uh, so that that all ended in. Uh, did you have any? I'm just being nosy, but did you have a required number of uh, takeoff, touch and goes before you? Were quote, ready for the next group so that you could advance in, in control? Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not aware of any particular number, but I know I looked in my logbook and there were days when, when we made as many as 14 landings in one day. Wow. And, and on most, at most of these places, I didn't mention it before, in addition to the main airfield we were staying at, they also had another airstrip away from there that we could use for shooting tech 
shooting uh, takes off, take off and landings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which which we did a great deal. Any difference in the tarmac, in the surface? No, at that time they were all uh, concrete. Okay. All the ones I I saw. And uh, the two airfields at uh, the ones in, in uh, Alabama and the one in, in uh, Indiana both had the same layout. They obviously were newly built air airfields, mm -hmm. and they, and they had runways that you could handle just any just about any angle of the compass. Uh, they didn't have to worry about prevailing winds and shear and that no, kind we could, of stuff. We could always get within, I'd say, 45 degrees of the wind or even less. Okay, you know. good. Okay, so when we finished there, that was the end of cadet training. And uh, that's when we, uh, it was on August 4th of 1944, when our class, which was uh, uh, labeled 44G, the G was for August, uh, that was when we graduated from flying school, when we got our wings, and when we got our commission. And uh, so... That's that picture we saw right at the, uh, at the outset. Yes, that's that picture. And uh, then, then we were given a furlough, and I was sent to uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, to learn to fly B-24s. And, and I was one of the lucky guys. I was sent to uh, an airfield to learn to fly another airplane, and some of them were sent to uh, uh, be co-pilots right off, and some of them went off to, off to uh, uh, Europe or the Pacific not too long after wow. that. Uh, but uh, I went to uh, Smyrna for, oh, maybe almost two months, and, and uh, all we did was fly a B-24 with, with an instructor when, when, we, when he was there, otherwise it would be with another another officer, okay. another pilot, oh, and we'd fly with a, uh, an engineer and a radio operator, as I remember, and the, and the airplane had no load in it other than the fuel. Uh, and and we, we learned a great deal about the uh, redundant, we went to air, uh, ground school every day, of course. We learned all the redundant uh, uh, capabilities of the aircraft, like there are three different ways to get the, the uh, wheels, wheels down, down yeah. and three different ways to get the uh, flaps down, mm -hmm. uh, uh, many ways to transfer fuel between gas tanks. Uh, and we, of course, fly, we flew the airplane with on three engines and two engines and one engine, and and, uh, and we flew a great deal of instruments. Now, talk about instruments. Did you have any uh, uh, navigators in training as part of your crews that they were getting trained as well as you guys to work? No, they were not being trained with us. Okay. We, we made, uh, in those days, the best you could do in bad weather, as far as getting to an airport, was using a radio system to g get you down to a thousand feet or uh, essentially yeah, what they it was talk doing. you down? No, no. Beam, you, you, radio you'd, beam? You'd, 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 you'd use radio beam, yeah. Oh, right. And, and uh, it, it was supposed to get you down uh, below a thousand feet so you could see the yeah. runway. See the pants for length. Yeah. And so we, we did quite a bit of that. Uh, we did some cross country flying. Surprisingly, cross-country flying is not as easy as some people think. When you're looking for something on the ground, you almost invariably find it, even if it isn't there. <laughs> oh, convenient. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, it's not really that bad, but <laughs> it, the biggest helps are rivers uh -huh. and railroads and, of course, towns. And in those days, quite a few towns uh, would have, a, uh, have the town name painted on some large building. Yeah, water tank or yeah, something. Well, yeah. like. Uh, and uh, actually, we started doing that that sort of uh, cross country when we were back in uh, advanced training. But but anyhow, by the time we left, by the time I left Smyrna and and all the other guys in the in the program, uh, we were ready to uh, fly with a B twenty four crew. Okay, fully loaded. Uh, well, I never. I, so far, I haven't flown a B twenty four with a load on it. Okay. Okay. Right. And, exciting. And we were we were trained mostly with uh, earlier vintage B-24s, which uh, were faster than the ones that we were going to fly later, because they didn't have have the nose turret on them, and, and they didn't have any load in them. 
So I went, I went from there to uh, Lemoore, California, and uh, I was uh, assigned a crew. So instead of flying by myself, I now had a co-pilot and a navigator. And oh, you were the command pilot? Yeah. I now had a co-pilot, a navigator, a bombardier, a radio man. A couple of waste gunners. An engineer, four gunners for each of the four turrets, yeah. and, and, uh, and the radio operator and the engineer operated the waste guns. They were, they were not in turrets. Uh, and after, they, after, we were, after I was assigned to a crew, I, we went to Tonopah, Nevada, which is a place nobody wanted to go to. They had other, three other uh, choices at the time, but we didn't make the choice. We were assigned to one. Tonopah, Nevada is halfway between, just about halfway between Las Vegas and Reno. It's, it's a, a vast wasteland, or it was. It's right, not, it's right near where the uh, atom bombs were sent off not so many years later. And, and there were large salt flats there. And we spent most of our time doing practice bombing. They had a, they had a, uh, a bomb, they had a field laid out with uh, uh, targets. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we spent most of, most of our time flying back and forth over that. And, and uh, the, the bombardier was dropping uh, sand-filled bombs. They were painted blue. And, and uh, that's when I found out the, uh, the bomb site wasn't as accurate as I thought it might be. Oh, you, uh, know, you had to kick it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, if the bombardier they had a building on the, they referred to as the shack. If they got close to the shack, why, you, you could hardly keep your ears from being broken and Whoa. blasted. I mean, it was pretty tough to uh, get. We were bombing from uh, 20,000 feet. At one altitude at all times, they have different high, low level oh, altitudes? Well, because the airfield was at approximately 5,000 feet altitude, we were, we were never flying around below maybe 12 oh, 15 and, K. And, uh, or 15, but we did the bombing exercises from 19 and 20 and 21. Good. Uh, and it got to be pretty darn cold out there and at those altitudes in uh, December and January. Didn't they have the flying suits, the electric oh, suits? No, no electric suits. We had those fur-lined oh. fur uh, pants and fur-lined yeah. jackets and fur-lined helmets. Like an Eskimo. Like an Eskimo and, and fur-lined boots. The airplane was very drafty. It had no heat in it. and, and uh, Okay. I was lucky. I sat in the sun because there was quite a bit of glass around me, but the rest <laughs> of the guys, they were even colder. Oh, well, don't knock it. Don't yeah, knock yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess we did qu quite a few landings out there. Okay. And well, what else did we do? Went, went to ground school, of course. The ground school never ends. And they would, they would, uh, they would use pursuit planes with uh, cameras. And and uh, the uh, or with targets, I should say, and our gunners had cameras, and uh, the pursuit planes would uh, provide uh, sh shooting practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, in a B twenty four, when you start to turn those turrets, and if you're in a formation, it's like a wrestling match uh, because the wind is hitting the airplane at say 165 or 170, and the turret is swinging around, and, and uh, it's like- All a, kinds of drag. Uh, all that. kinds of uh, uh, change effect on mm -hmm. the air and the aircraft. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of a joke that uh, B-24 pilots all ended up with uh, very heavy left, very heavy muscles on their left arm because you'd be, you'd be flying along with the left arm on there on the uh, on the wheel. Uh, I guess we were there till uh, till we left in uh, must must have been uh, February of uh, forty five. Okay, to go uh, where? Now you to, to go, crew's to, all trained. You're going overseas uh, now. Yeah, not yet. Oh. Then then we went to uh, Salinas, California, 
and I picked up a brand new uh, B24, an M model, that was the latest model they made. It came from the Ford factory, and uh, I often laugh about it. <clears throat> I signed a piece of paper for it for that I was responsible for this airplane. All mine. <clears throat> all mine, all mine. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the mistakes I made was, you may remember, years ago, automobiles had a, a uh, logo on the horn. It was mm -hmm. plastic right in the middle yeah. of the horn. Well, they had a beautiful one of those on each wheel on a B-24 when it came out of the factory. And the first time I went out to look at the airplane, it was there. When I came back the next day, the two of them were gone. Yeah, souvenir. It was a marvelous souvenir, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we went out and we had to calibrate the uh, compass. We didn't take the whole crew, but we calibrate the compass and uh, signed a whole lot of papers. And uh, then we went from there, from Salinas, California, to Sacramento. And Sacramento was a jumping off point for uh, flying to the Pacific. And I guess I'm one of the few pilots who left for overseas twice. Oh? Two nights in a row. Uh, well, incidentally, this is the first time. It begs time. a question, obviously. Yeah. We, we had, had uh, we, got, we got up, it was the first time I had flown a uh, B-24 with <clears throat> 3,500 gallons of gasoline on it. They put extra tanks in the bomb bay to make the, the leg make to, the hop, to, yeah. to, to Hawaii. Yeah. And uh, so <laughs> when I ran up the engines on, on the end of the runway, it kind of sat there and shuddered for a while before it decided to move. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we, we, we got up in the air okay, and uh, I don't think we'd been up more than 15 or 20 minutes. And, and one of the guys came up, he had gone down below for, for the ride. He came up and his May West was all spattered. We had hit a, hit a bird. And, and that model of the B-24 has a bulge window down around the uh, bombardier's compartment, down underneath. Mm -hmm. and, and the bird had shattered the window. <laughs> he, he was a mess, lucky he wasn't hurt. And I, I had noticed that the airspeed had dropped off a bit. But I didn't think too much of it. But after I saw what had happened, I, I called back and said I was returning, which uh, apparently didn't happen very often because they started asking me a bunch of questions. So I had to, because of having all that weight on the airplane with, uh, with the gasoline, uh, I flew around for five hours to burn it, off, burn it off. Burn it off. You couldn't take off and dump it over the sea? No, you no know, and on that airplane, you couldn't dump fuel. Oh. Uh, so I, I think I burned off about five hours worth of it, which is probably 1,500 gallons, close to it. And uh, luckily, they were able to replace the window. <clears throat> it wasn't very big. It was only maybe six by ten, yeah, but, but it had a bulge in it. But it was a bulge, yeah. yeah. They were able to replace it the next day, and we took off again the next night. We, we, these two flights were both night flights, uh, so they could use celestial navigation. And it took us 14 hours and I think 20 minutes to get to Hawaii. But you have to realize we're only flying at 165 miles an hour. Yeah, and the headwind's coming and, at you. And, and you're flying from east to west, so yeah. you most likely have a headwind too. So we didn't have any trouble finding Hawaii, uh, but I, I was a little bit concerned though when we landed because we had lost a, fair amount of hydraulic fluid uh, on the way, we, or at least we found a fair amount of hydraulic fluid in the, in the back compartment of the airplane that had uh, leaked out somewhere. But luckily we had enough left to uh, have good brakes when we landed. Mm -hmm. I, I, could, I could put down the landing gear and I could put down the flaps and the brakes worked. So yeah, it was props. <laughs> You can't reverse props on no? a, on that airplane, no. I'm dating myself. I don't know if you ever could on a four-engine, no. four props. Although I don't know what B-29s had. Uh, so we we took a, we had a day off. We spent a day. We I slept for a long time after that flight. Uh, we had the next day off, and we got into Honolulu. But the next morning we took off for uh, Canton Island. That was ten hours and some odd. The next day we went to Tarawa, which was I think about seven hours, 
The next day we went to Guadalcanal. And the next day we went to Biak, which is off the north end of New Guinea, Biak Island. And uh, I added it up, it was 48 hours, and I figured about uh, 7,900 uh, land miles. Wow. No, we, we didn't use nautical miles. It was a long, it was a long trip, but uh, to me it was, it was a great adventure. I, I had always been interested in airplanes, and I used to see the uh, clipper planes take off mm. from Long, Long Island. Uh, so this was fun. In, fa in fact, it was the first time on the flight to Hawaii, it's the first time we ever flew over water other than lakes and rivers. Uh, but anyhow, we, we got to Biak. From Biak, we went to Nadzab, which was on New, Gu New Guinea, and uh, we flew missions over to uh, Rabaul on New Britain and up to Wewak, which was a, an aerodrome on northern, northeastern New Guinea, the Japanese, and they were still there and they were still shooting. Uh, yeah, because this is now what June, July, and no, this this was this was May and, and June. Okay, May in June, forty-five. In forty-five, and then I was assigned. I, as yet, I haven't been in a in a uh, regular uh, everyday bomb group. This they consider this uh, extra training, even though we were, we were getting a little bit of flag coming up flag, at us. Yeah, yeah. that makes it realistic. Yeah, it does. And then we went to Clark Field and on uh, Rizan, and, and uh, I, then I was in the 22nd Bomb Group in the 33rd Squadron. Uh, there were a lot of airplanes at Clark Field at that time. And was, this, was that the 5th Air Group? And that was 5th Air Force, yeah. yes, 5th okay. Air Force. And we were, flying, we were bombing Formosa at that time, or the 20th... Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah, the 22nd Bomb Group was. and. Uh, now you told me something about some of your bombing ex exercises going flying like that. Uh, Can you explain a few of them, if you would? Well, as a matter, yeah, you we know, without security. <laughs> uh, we we had one one flight up there where we were, we were in formation, of course, and uh, luckily we were on on the outside on the left wing, and uh, our bombardier was was over the target and the. Most of the, of the formation was off to the right. So he dropped our bomb, bombs, and I'm told we got a pretty good hit. And the other, the other group had to make a second run, which is something you like to avoid if you can. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, when we went up to Formosa, we had a, uh, a, a submarine out off the land. We'd fly all the way up the west coast of Formosa and then turn in, make a right right angle turn into the target area. And we had a submarine out there, and we'd also have a B-17 with a boat slung underneath it that was out there that they could drop to us. Because if, if you really got into trouble, you wanted to get out over the water quickly, because the natives were not friendly on Taiwan at that time. No. Uh, and let's see, what else? Oh, they sent me on a this is from Clark Field now. We, they had an old uh, B-24 that was pretty beat up, and they sent me down to Biak where they still had a, a, quite a number of new B-24s. That's where I left mine when I brought it over from the States. So I picked up a new, 24, new B-24 on Biak. Uh, it had been spray painted black, and apparently the wind was blowing when they did it because it was rough in spots on the outside. And when I took off, I lost power, quite a bit of power on the outside left engine. So because I took off from a runway that ends with as a cliff uh, palisade going down, mm -hmm. I took, took the airplane right down on the deck to build up a little more airspeed. And what had happened was an amplifier had burned out or quit on, on the four engine for the turbo supercharger. And so I asked the engineer to, I sh shouldn't say I asked, I told him to replace the uh, amplifier on the turbo, and that, that brought the engine back up to full power. So we, we got out of that mess. Uh, I was able to get regular, get back to regular airspeed. And we were flying up to uh, Peleliu, which is a marine, marine island, 
and apparently our IFF went out. It was working when we left BIAC, but it wasn't working when I got anyways near Peleliu. So, <clears throat> pardon me, a couple of Marine fighters came out to look me over, which wasn't too comfortable a feeling. Yeah. And uh, wiggle, the, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. I did the wiggle, wiggle, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, so I landed on, on Peleliu and caught hell for not having my IFF on. Yeah. But uh, they found it was out also, just like I did, and they fixed it overnight. But the reason I had gone back, I had flown directly from Clark to Biak on the way down. But, but I flew from Biak to, to Peleliu on the way north because I understood the Marines had sheets on the beds in the BOQ up there, <laughs> and they had a bar. <laughs> you baby in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was told that by one of the older pilots, so that that worked out pretty well. Oh. And uh, the next day, I uh, f flew from from uh, Peleliu via Tacloban back up to Clark. And uh, I don't know how far we how we fixed for time, but well, let's see. We got eleven minutes right now. Okay, well, I better you talk a little bit faster. Uh, I wasn't one of the oldest crews in in the uh, bomb group. So I went from uh, Luzon to Okinawa on an LST, oh, and, zip it. And, and it took six days, as I remember. It was it was a, <laughs> it was it was one hot ride. Uh, it was it was now uh, the end of June, and I and the the, the LST tied up on Okinawa. The morning after the the morning of the night, the morning after the night when the first A bomb was dropped oh, on Hiroshima, the sixth of August, and and I I missed the missed all the fireworks. Thank goodness, because I understand everything was falling mm -hmm. <laughs> from from all the uh, celebrating. That's the problem we had. You guys forget it goes up, it also uh, oh, comes down, comes back yeah. down. So we lost a lot of tents that way. So we were we were billeted. Uh, fairly far up on the west shore of Okinawa. What, by right, Kadena, beyond then? Oh, I, I was right opposite Aishima. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any pile place. Yeah, and I, I was there when the Japanese, the white Japanese Betty Bomber came in with the representatives to, to uh, oh. talk about the, the peace. The peace, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where they went from Aishima. Maybe they stayed there. I don't know. But I saw it land, I, and I, I knew what it was. Uh, while I was on Okinawa, I, I went through one one of those big, it was, it was the biggest typhoon I guess they'd had in quite a while. Quite a while. And uh, our airplanes were flown back to the States by the oldest crews in September. And so they brought in some A-20s and A-26s, and I, I got to fly those. Uh, not, not the greatest way to learn how. I had 20 minutes instruction laying on my, flat on my stomach behind the pilot, <laughs> and after that he said, go get them. Yeah, it's yours. <laughs> it's yours. And it was quite a change because a B-24 was laying, it was, you come down the, the approach at 120 and an A-20 you come down at 150. Yeah. So the runway got to be quite a bit shorter. Real fast. Uh, but I enjoyed it. It was like uh, going from a Mack truck to a, a sports car. Uh, and one day I couldn't resist. There was a sh freighter out off the uh, west side of uh, Okinawa, and I decided, well, I'll have a little fun and buzz them. So I, I tilted the nose down on the A-20 and got it up to about 300, and went by the stern, pretty pretty close to the deck, and pulled it back up. And I saw the engines are running too cool, so I leaned out the gasoline mixture, and all of a sudden there was no noise. I cut off both uh, engines, yeah. but the guy hadn't told me there's no, on, on the, you have a mixture control, you have automatic settings, which you ordinarily use, but on the A20, between the automatic settings, there's no, no fuel at all, they just cut off. So were you a dead stick then? So yeah, a, a dead stick, but I had, I had plenty of airspeed, thank God, right. and it took me a few seconds to realize what was wrong. That's an extremely loud airplane, when you fly it, You've got these two big engines with no mufflers on them, right, right far from ears. your ears. Yeah. yeah, and all of a sudden there's no noise. So I, and you don't lose two engines at once. So I knew I had screwed up. So, but anyhow, I got through that, and uh, then after a few months on uh, Okinawa, 
we were uh, moved to, uh, oh, by now we're, we're an organization that can't fly the airplanes because all the maintenance people had gone home. They moved us to uh, uh, an airstrip outside Otami, which is outside Osaka in Japan. And we were in a, uh, what had been factory workers, uh, walled community. Yeah, and there were, there were about, I'd, I'd guess, about 80 of us. They were all bomb pilots, bombardiers, and navigators with nothing to do. So the, the, the three guys on my crew were still with me. We each volunteered for a job, and I volunteered to pick up the food. And, and, uh, you mean the local market? No, no, no the, local, the local quartermaster place. Oh, okay. Ah. So I, I was dri driving one of those three-axle trucks down there to... With a with a with a Jap riding with me to pick up the food and bring it back, it was it was kind of a challenge on those narrow streets, believe me. And uh, one of the one of the other guys picked up the uh, uh, the motor pool, what little there was. We only had a few jeeps, but it enabled us to have a jeep available. Mm -hmm. And another one took the uh, small uh, PX, if you want to call it that. But anyhow, we were pretty well provided. We had the food and the and the car. And so we got to do a little sightseeing. We went over to uh, Kyoto. We went to uh, a place by the name of Takarazuka, which is a resort not, not too far from Kobe. And, and uh, we played golf over there one day. There were some football games with, uh, by GIs at a stadium in Kobe. We went over there a few times. Uh, Kobe was a uh, shipbuilding city. And uh, the area all along the water, when, at that time, was just a mass of twisted steel. Just a mess. Uh, just a mess. And it also had a sizable uh, settlement of uh, foreign uh, diplomatic and, and uh, well, just foreign foreign people. Like uh, they, they were, we we could see from um, the names we saw in some of the mailboxes that oh. there were Swedes and well, Swedes and and. and uh, Spanish and all kinds of di different people over there. I guess they were all. Uh, okay, well, I'm checking the clock. We got about uh, five minutes five left. Minutes ago. I'd like. How did you get home, and, and what happened when you got home? Uh, did you fly home or come by? No, uh, I, I went by train to Tokyo, and then uh, they put us on a freighter. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of sad because there's some nice looking ships tied up nearby, but we got on. You didn't get that one. We didn't get that one. Uh, and and uh, so it took us, I'd say, nine or ten days to get back. We've, we we uh, sailed from uh, the Tokyo area to uh, Seattle. Okay. But we got pretty far north. Uh, the we we had uh, seagulls all the way back, all the way back. And we got a big reception in uh, Seattle. They, they made boat, you feel good. Huh? The boat came out with a band on it and all kinds of uh, flags and banners. And uh, yeah, it made us feel pretty good. good. And it, it's a beautiful sail, if you haven't done it, from uh, the ocean into Seattle. I've done it several times. Oh, yeah, it's very, very attractive. I, I, I got a big kick. It was in the daylight, of course, okay. when we did it. After you welcoming home, how'd you get home? Uh, then. To wherever. We, we stayed at, it was Fort Lawton, and, and it was up, up on a high area in uh, Seattle. They put us on a train and, uh, in, in Pullman's, uh, which was nice, and we went from, uh, from there to uh, Fort Dix. Is in, that where in, you were discharged? In, in New Jersey, that's where I was discharged. Okay. And I, I still remember, it, this was in the, in the beginning of February now, we, it, the train went right through the high mountains. I don't remember which mountains those are, just, just east of the Seattle area there in Washington. And they stopped at a high plateau. And <laughs> by this time we had been on the train, I think a day and a half, and a lot of us decided we'd just like to get out and stretch our legs. God, was it cold up there. I, I can't remember the name of the, it's, it's a railroad stop. Oh. On a flat plan t plan plane, all right. Uh, but it was freezing, and, because these are all steam trains, 
you know, right through the mountains. It was beautiful uh, in, in that time of year. Now, when you got home and got discharged, did you take advantage of the GI Bill to continue yes. your education? I went, I went right back to college. Okay. And I uh, was very happy to find almost everybody who was there before came back. Okay. And the big question is so that we make sure we get the women in. Where and when were you married? And how's your family? Oh, I, I was married. We've got to make sure we get the girls in there. Yeah, I was married in 1949 in uh, Garden City, Long Island. And uh, what, what was the other part of it? Yeah, how are your kids and your family today? Oh, they're fine. Uh, we, have a, we have a daughter who lives in Manchester. She has two children, and they each have a family. And we, they have, amongst them, they have four great-grandchildren. Good. And uh, my, my son has two children also. Uh, his kids are a little bit younger, but uh, they're... Uh, they're both, out, they're both, all four of the grandchildren have graduated from college. Wow. And two of them have, have further degrees. And, and the other two are, have very nice jobs. So they're, they're, they're very lucky. Silly question, but I have to ask it. With all you've seen and done and where you've been, would you consider your military experience positive or negative as far as how it's affected your life? And well, I'd say very positive. Very positive. I, I immediately found when I went back to uh, uh, college <laughs> that the, the marks got much better. Oh, you uh, had a purpose now. I had a purpose now, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I, I was very, very happy when I went yeah. back, yeah. I, I came back without a scratch on me. That's and, even better. That's even better, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that time, my friend, to say thank you. Well, thank you, For Bob. your service and your time. Oh, you're nice and warm. I appreciate it, yeah. That's a wrap, folks. Again, I ask those of you, if you can, mm -hmm. and will get a hold of me if you have a story to tell. We'll do all we can to make it worth your while, and we'll answer the question that you've been asked a million times. Hey, what did you do in the war? This is your chance to document it without any frills. Bob Stevens saying thank you. Come and see us, please.